welcome to Pushing the Limits. I have a bit of a rock star for you. I've got Dr. Jim Laval with me. Dr. Jim, welcome to the show. It's fantastic to have you. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Anytime I get to visit New Zealand, I'm all in. Yeah, wow, exactly. At least virtually you're visiting New Zealand right now. (laughs) Where do we start, Dr. Jim? Because like you and I are athletes you've been a bodybuilder i've been an ultra marathon runner we know like when when the coach says jump you ask how high you do the thing that you're told to do um you know you're willing to go the extra mile you're willing to take a hundred things and do a hundred things every day if that's what's required to 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 be a better athlete or to be performing at your best and and you know i'm retired now from my competitive career as well but i'm still an athlete i've still trained like a maniac i still you know but i also know now to rest and recover and do all those other things and get my cortisol under control and all of that that I didn't know as a young athlete, right? So I think that's actually um, a good place to start is one of the main epidemics that we have is stress. Stress, and what does stress do to our bodies? Because everyone knows that stress is bad, but stress can be good when it's a hermetic stress and stress can be bad when it's an overwhelm and, you know, I've got to pass as an ultra marathon runner. So I went extreme, which was extreme right. inflammation and extreme breakdown of the gut lining and extreme of hormone course. imbalances and all those sorts of things, which I didn't understand back in the day do now. One of the reasons I'm not doing ultra marathons currently because I want to live a long time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us That's a little bit about right. the stress story. What happens sure. to our body with cortisol and co? So there's a lot of things that happen. So first is to understand allostasis and allostatic load. So your body is built to handle a certain amount of stress. And it's actually good. It's good that your body can handle that stress and it has the ability to create stress hormones. The trouble we get into is when we get stuck in fight or flight response. Now you did it through being an ultra marathon runner right? You know, you disrupt the microbiome, you trigger a lot of stress hormones, you lower your sex hormones. So the first thing that happens when you start to make too high of stress hormones, there's two things. One, you're supposed to make stress hormones in the morning, then they drop at noon, then they drop again and get at about four to five o'clock, then they drop to nothing at bedtime, then you release melatonin and your body goes to sleep. And it resets the circadian pattern of your hormones in your body not just cortisol hormones, but literally when the, when you have something called the super chiasmatic nucleus or the master slave clock, when that gets off, you're going to regulate your glucose poorly. You're going to regulate your thyroid hormone wow. poorly, right? Yeah. So right away, stress is supposed to be cortisol high in the morning and it drops down. And when it doesn't drop down, it's called flattening of your cortisol curve. You start to make more stress hormones all day long. And when you do that, you increase your risk of you know, diabetes, heart disease, neurodegenerative disorders, mood disorders. And there's a reason for that. So when cortisol goes up, you lower, it's called your free cortisol. It goes up, you lower something called gonadotropin releasing hormone. Mm-hmm. And gonadotropin releasing hormone is what tells you to make your sex hormones. Gonadotropin releasing hormone. So that goes down and now I'm not making hormones like I should. Now, in your case, because you were ultra lean and you didn't have body fat, that was another reason. You didn't have the building blocks to make the hormones. Right, right. So you were in your case, your body was saying, uh-uh, don't make them because we're under a lot of stress. And well, it doesn't matter because I don't have the building blocks for them anyway. Right. So, so that's one step. The next thing that happens is you lose growth hormone releasing hormone. Mm -hmm. So you start to get sarcopenic, you lose muscle. The other thing that happens um, when cortisol is high and you trigger an inflammation response chronically So your body's supposed to take and have an inflammatory response or a stress response, and then it responds and it turns off and you're back in homeostasis or back in balance. Mm -hmm. So when it doesn't happen, so now my growth, you know, growth hormone goes down, sex hormones go down. And when cortisol goes high, 
your glucose is kept in your bloodstream. Exactly. Because yep. your body thinks you need to fight a white tiger where it's you just have 50 emails to answer. Or you got to go pick your kid up. And my gosh, I got to pick my kid up. I got this deadline at work. I know, gee, I want to watch the show. I got all these things happen. I got to go to the gym. And so all these things, your body interprets as, you know, life or death. So primitive nervous system in a modern world. Exactly. And so yep. when I when I do that, now my glucose goes up. And when you're, what happens is, is it's going up because your brain is, as it's releasing that cortisol, you're releasing more inflammatory cytokines, in particular, interleukin-6, and you release TNF-alpha. Mm -hmm. And that makes the insulin receptor become sluggish to keep your blood, in, your glucose in your blood. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is, is now your insulin starts to go up. Wow. Yep. And when your insulin goes up, you start making more adrenaline. And now you're losing blood flow. So when you said, why is stress such a big deal? It's why blood pressure goes up. Your blood yep. vessels cramp. You're making more adrenaline. Uh, and then what starts to happen? This is such a big topic. We could, can, I, can I come back and talk to you? Absolutely. It, it's going to be a big, it's going to be a big one. So, <laughs> so now my glucose is up. My insulin's up. Insulin is the most inflammatory compound in your body. All right. Now, when glucose and insulin go up and cortisol's up, you inhibit thyroid hormone. Wow. So now I'm cortisol is catabolic, glucose is inefficient. Now my thyroid hormone is going down. And you're doing that to protect you because when cortisol's up and adrenaline goes up, your heart rate goes up. And the way your body counters that is to turn down thyroid hormone. Right. Thyroid hormone is what regulates your heart rhythm. You see? So it's these three hormones that are kind of leveraged together. They can either work in harmony or they can be in dysfunction. And so in your case, like you said, the leaky gut, as the cortisol went up, your brain's releasing those inflammatory cytokines through what's called the enteric nervous system. Mm -hmm. It goes to your gut and it triggers something called, and what that does is it makes your gut more permeable. Wow. So your, your tight junctions break and now you're reacting to foods because you're not breaking your foods down completely and they slip in between the cracks of those mm -hmm. cells. Yep. And you have these things called antigen presenting cells mm -hmm. and you present that high, that peptide, that lectin, that dairy, that gluten, that soy, that almond, whatever it is, presents it to your immune system. And now you start making reactivity to it. Yep. And now mm -hmm. you get runner's diarrhea. Yep. Or you get and that. Cancer, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. You get an irritable bowel and you get, wow. you know, kind of the classic things. You can start to get reactive airway. It's another one, right? That yep. happens in a lot of, you yep. know, endurance athletes. They get reactive airway because they start making all this histamine from this, you know, gut breaking down. So when you ask, what about stress? I'm not even getting into the deep stuff yet. We're in the shallow water. Mm hmm we we haven't even gotten deep yet this uh, is you know, beautiful this is a path like it's just this i want people to listen to that last five minutes over and over again so you get that pathway so you get that understanding of this step that step that step and this is where it's, and it's kind of the journey they go on right hey i'm getting kind of tired now mm. i'm craving carbs because i'm not really good at you know keeping my energy right my thyroid slowed down. I got midday fatigue. I'm gaining weight. Yeah. Crash at one o'clock. You know, it's that pathway of understanding how I feel is being dictated by the symphony or the chaos of my hormones in the day. Wow. And so, so the next step is, well, now that your gut's broken down and now that your immune system is now reacting, now you're going to send signals to the brain. And now the brain goes through what's called neuroinflammation. Mm. You activate the glial cells of the brain. Yep. 
triggers a bunch of oxidative stress, meaning your rate of rusting of your neurons go up. The neurons die. And when they die, they release chemical compounds that trigger more neuroinflammation. Well, how is that going to feel? In the early stages, it's, I always say to you, feel like you're pushing a thought through jello. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I'm trying to think clear, but I can't, right? As it progresses, you get into more of the neurodegenerative issues, right? You know, you can develop conditions or diseases. Mm -hmm. and, and remember, dementia is thought of as type three diabetes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now we went from adrenal thyroid pancreas, and now the gut is triggering the brain and the immune system to be overreactive. So when you're under chronic stress, you know, it, it really has this ripple effect through all of your metabolism. Your bad actor lipids go up, your particles of your LDL cholesterol get smaller, you know, and those, and what's bad about that is, is you start to embed those into the inner lining of your yep. artery through the glycocalyx, the, mm -hmm. the brushy, hairy border of the inner lining of the artery. Yep. And you're, and you're plowing those in there. And because you're reacting to foods, you're making a bunch of macrophages and the macrophages attack that. So it's a process that takes you from, I'm under stress. My glucose is off. My immune system is starting to get haywire. And now I'm starting to plaque my arteries. You said one, two, three, four step. And this is the, this is the metabolic, the, how people are broken and they don't know they're broken often. And most right. people are like 85%, I think of Americans, because we know American statistics better than Kiwi ones are metabolically broken. You know, oh, I think one and two is either diabetic or pre-diabetic. Um, That's exactly is, right. Yeah. And it's not much different here. Um, and, and this is a, a very predictable pathway that has so many ramifications. And, and in that pathway that you just described, you might develop an autoimmune disease here or a neurodegenerative disease there or cardiovascular disease there or cancer over here, depending on your particular combination of things that's going on in your and your genetics and your environment and everything that you've been exposed to and uh, over yes. your lifetime. And, and, and this right. is how disease happen. And people like, often they will come and they will just say, oh, it's just, you're just getting old, you know. Well, yes, you are getting older and these things happen more when you're older, but it's a predictable process that we can at least slow down. And I think in the next 20 years, we're going to be able to reverse with a bit of luck with some amazing doctors and scientists. And that's what this show is all about. Um, being able to slow and reverse aging. Um but this this pathway that you've just described for us in in absolutely beautiful detail because that was really a one plus one plus one plus one equals one hell of a mess basically <laughs> <laughs> and 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 you know this is relevant for the athlete listening you know I've got a lot of athletes listening who do a lot of athletes, running yeah, uh, you know what I I always say athletes. And overweight people, my metabolic syndrome people, a lot of times their chemistry looks identical. The only difference is the athlete looks good. Yeah. But their yeah. chemistry is still breaking it's down. Still... They're not repairing, right? Yeah. We all got two adrenals. We all got one heart. We all got one liver. We got two kidneys. And I think the big epidemic with all of this is that, you know, people's kidney filtration, you know, you know we're seeing people at earlier and earlier ages with kidney issues. And yep. You, know, you brought it up before we started the the talk. I mean, you know, pesticides, toxic metals, that's the extra layer, right? I mean, you, you that's where, oh my gosh, I'm going to get Parkinson's because I've got a lot of pesticides in me. Maybe I'm going to get cancer because I got a lot of mercury in me, right? There's all these things are shifting and you don't realize it till you're almost over the waterfall, right? You're, yeah. You're, you're, you're floating right till that big old waterfall and you're going to go off it if you don't start to look at some signs of well how am i feeling what can i do about it and it's like you said earlier you know i'm a, i'm a spartan too if you told me 10 things to do i'd be mad because you didn't tell me 12 yeah <laughs> and if 12 was the normal 12 was the normal thing to do that you gave everybody i'd be like hey look i know you give everybody 12 but 
I need the extra juice. Come on, give it to me. I got to have 14, you know, and I'm going to do them all starting today. Right. That's us. But most people aren't there. Most people are, you know, struggling to make one change. And I think a lot of it because they're so mitochondrially damaged. Mm -hmm. They're fatigued. They can't think clear. They don't have the energy. It's effort. And that and that mitochondrial damage many times starts with going back to that poor glucose regulation where you, you know, you heard of the Warburg effect, right? Yep. Glute one transport, you suck glucose into your cell passively and, and then you make a bunch of lactic acid. So your cells get acidic. Uh, you don't make a lot of energy, you make a lot of waste byproducts. And then you turn on those cancer causing genes, right? That's mm -hmm. what, that's what happens. Yep. And it's the metabolic I, I side so of cancer. People, they're right in. I, I wrote a chapter in a textbook called Diabetes and Cancer, Epidemiologic Links and Molecular Evidence. Wow. Perfect night reading. I mean, you yeah, yeah. Read it's light reading for the... It's, it's, yeah. it's going to take you out. It's like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> but, but, it, but it's so important to understand that you are dictating your future health. Exactly. And, and we can, we can, you. we can lower the risk factors. You know, we can't guarantee that you're never ever going to get cancer if you follow a really good diet and you're low, low carb or whatever, but you are lowering the risk factors. I've released a book called what your oncologist isn't telling you. And it's all about the metabolic approach to cancer after interviewing many of the world's top doctors and scientists at the cutting edge, because I was faced with a situation with my mum three years ago where she had a CNS lymphoma, a very aggressive cancer in the brain, and they gave us no options and nothing to do. She was 80 years old. What do you want to do? She's, she's right. going to die. You know, she's going to die in the next yeah. few weeks probably because it's very aggressive and very fast. And then, you know, that, that sent me down the whole metabolic road of, of, of right. research and, and doing the metabolic, you know, very, very strict diet, very strict keto, low carb, off-label drug combinations, uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, intravenous vitamin C, peptides, which you can't get in New Zealand very easily, I can tell you. Um, right. I'm very creative in the way I do things. Um, all, all these things. And, uh, you know, it took us 12 weeks to actually get rid of the tumors on the, on the MRI. And the MRI is the only way we can see how her cancer is doing. Right. Um, we're now three years in, and the last MRI was clear. Um, and, you know, she's she's doing amazing. And we've had a few other blips along the way because of some of the things we put in the mix, like gut issues, because of all the, right. the, the surgeries and the vagal nerve problems and the constipation and the uh, some of the drugs yeah. that she had to be on, right? Um, sure. So now we're dealing with all that. Now, wouldn't it have been better if I could rewind the clock 20 years and go, mum, don't get overweight in the first place. Don't get diabetic in the first place because she had an aneurysm and a stroke eight years ago as well. And if I had known back then all of the things that I know now, um, then I could have prevented all of that pain, suffering, horror, horrific. And this is what drives me, Jim, is that I don't want other people to go through the stuff that I've had to go through with her and that she's had to experience and that I've had to rehabilitate her from because it's one hell of a lot harder to, to a lot get of some work. Uh, a lot of work. work. It's, you yeah. know, my, my life revolves around her. She's sitting on the exercise cycle next to me right now as we speak. <laughs> All right. Doing her, doing her exercise while she waits till I, you know, get ready to Just take no her to the gym. Just no marathons. Just <laughs> no marathons. No, but, you know, she's 82 and we, we do things, you know, relatively. We were not, um, not smashing the crap out of her, but it's, um, being in that preventative mindset, understanding the horrors of disease, like, when you have a disease, you'll do anything not to have that disease. But to try to get into the mind of someone who doesn't have a disease and trying to get them to be preventative, to spend some money on testing, on supplements, on things, right. going to the gym, right. whatever. Food, better yep. food. Better food, definitely. Talk They're like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, you know. Yeah. Well, tomorrow yeah. might be the day that you get diagnosed with something. And then we, we, we're already on that continuum towards disease very, very often. And you don't know it. And people go, but I feel, you know, relatively good. Everyone yeah, says, you know, yeah, I'm only okay. 40 pounds overweight. Yeah, yeah. but I'm, I'm a healthy overweight. Yeah. Um, you know, like that, that sort of mindset is just, to me, like, I, I just want to shake people and go, wake up. <laughs> 
because where we landed was not a not a nice place for you to go to, and we've got I, to be I preventative. It's, it, it's interesting that you had a parent experience, and I think they're very powerful. And I'll share with you one of mine. My father was a type two diabetic, world famous chef, top hundred chefs in the world. Wow. Right. Like national chef of the year in the U S I mean, he was famous, but he was a diabetic. And I got to remember he's a chef in the fifties, sixties, seventies, and eighties. Right. So, you know, very yep. rich food. Yep. And, and, um, at the age of 79, being a diabetic for now 39 years, wow. he developed the duodenal adenocarcinoma. Wow. Diabetics have eight times more the risk of developing a, a cancer, a GI cancer, than someone in the, you know, that's not a diabetic. Eight times. So he would have a surgery done. And he didn't tolerate chemo, so we were fortunate. They didn't, we didn't want to do that. But he, the surgery is called a Whipple. And what you do is you take the lower third of the stomach, all of the duodenum, and the top third of the pancreas. Oh, so this is the most intense GI surgery. Typically, people will live between six months to three years when they're half his age. Wow. Right? Yeah. So he came to live with us at age 79. And of course, he came and I said, well, chef, your kitchen has changed. <laughs> You're in my house now. <laughs> yeah, you're in my house now, buddy. This is all, all this stuff's over. But it's interesting. A couple of things happened. One, my son was young and he got to be around my son. And I, I just want to, I, I really want to emphasize that I think social connection with your family and having family that truly cares about you and like what you're doing with your mother, I'm just, it's wonderful that she's <laughs> right there. Uh, because it gave him meaning and purpose to wake up in the morning and cook my son breakfast, you know, to be able to go and cook for the other veterans of foreign war. He would go and donate his time. Lovely. And, but basically we changed his diet, gave him some things to take, got him moving, got his blood sugar better. He lived an additional 13 years. Wow. That is amazing. He lived to 91. Oh, and wow. I, you know, and I say this to any GI doc, they go, you're full of crap. I'm like, well, here's the date of his Whipple. Here's his medical records. Here's his death certificate. Uh, you know, that's he, incredible. And and I think what we do is we shortchange the power of what you and I believe in. Yeah. Because with all the, the focus on what we're doing to change the stress axis and get people to be not diabetic. 50% of the U S population is either diabetic or insulin resistant. Mm. We're going to approach 50% obesity, wow. right? Heart disease is the number one killer. Parkinson's on the rise, mm -hmm. right? Nothing, nothing looking good to me. No, um, it's all going to get fixed with those Embic. Everybody's going to be, you know, shooting in the GLP ones and you know, <laughs> hey, that's going to fix everybody. Not quite. But the point, the point being is, it's powerful. Look what you did for your mother. I hear that story and I'm amazed with the power of natural therapies. Yep. And lifestyle. And it's yep. just like, you, you, you know, and look, I've written four databases on natural products. I mean, serious databases. Amazing. I've actually written my fifth on pep. And I love you know, pep I mean, the amount of books and articles, I mean, it's crazy. And it still amazes me that, you know, people aren't adopting as quickly as I would hope. I mean, I'm mm. figuring by the time I die, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I'll get a bronze statue, you know, holding a bowl of salad, <laughs> right? Holding a bowl of salad. Like, yeah, it's important to eat healthy food. And everybody is in these camps, you know, of, oh, you know, like oh, uh, yeah. I have discussions with my brother who's into bodybuilding or, you know, um, muscle sure. and surfing. And he's like, you know, do I go keto? Do I go keto? Every week it's, do I do keto? It's like, carnivore. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, carnivore. Do I? Go? And I'm like, eat your damn veggies for a starters, you know, like that's a piece of the, 
equation that you're missing here. Yeah, you can do your keto, which is great. Go low carb. Absolutely. And things, but as long as you get, get your veggies, your veggies in. in. Get your veggies in. Get your veggies well, in. Well, you know, I, I started last week, I started a, a low FODMAP, keto, paleo, pescatarian, <laughs> vegan diet. <laughs> really limiting, though, I'm telling you. I'm like really confused on what to eat now. But because I intermittent fast 22 hours a day, I don't have to worry about eating. I became a breatharian. I just breathe in my nutrients now. I don't have to worry about eating. <laughs> But that's the state of the world and everybody's confused. And when you're out there and you're trying to work this stuff out and you're not, you know, deep in the weeds like we are, um, it is confusing and it is difficult. And then the experts change their mind every five minutes as well. You know, so I like to bring it back to some basics and we don't have to be extreme and everybody is genetically 100%. different. This is the other thing. What works for you may not work for me. And we need to respect that. And a menstruating woman so or right a pregnant on. woman is going to be different. She shouldn't be intermittent fasting. You know, like That's the right. intermittent fasting craze is something that, yeah, it's great for a lot of people, but not if you've got adrenal fatigue, not if you've got, you know, if you're just about to have your period or you just had a yeah. baby, maybe not, you know? Well, and what I found on a lot of those folks, I mean, first of all, like I've used the same, basically the same diet for almost 40 years now. Mm-hmm. They eat a lot of vegetables. Good. Yeah, eat a, lot. eat a lot of vegetables. Eat clean proteins, legumes and carbs as you can handle them based on your level of activity or your genetics. And watch out for the foods that you're sensitive to. Wow. There you go. There, there you I go. Mean, and pretty pretty basic and some yeah, good well, <laughs> uh, good quality oils. And, and just coming back to yeah. the whole, you know, mum story, like uh, in my listeners, you know, I wrap it on career change you know she's my impetus for my books that I've written the the learning curve that I've gone on you know um she's lost 50 at last count 59 kilos you know she was 108 kilos and now she's Gosh. what is she 57 or something and you know she's a small lady and she's you know like that's massive that's a whole person that she's lost she was wider than she was tall yeah she was you know very overweight but she was eating the food pyramid she was going to the weight watchers she was going you know back in the day before all this kicked off she was going to the gym she was going to the pool and she just couldn't shift the weight but she'd be eating the rice crackers and the things at you know nine o'clock at night and she'd be doing which in on the packet it says you know this is great for you you know um in the circadian rhythm piece of the, the pie um you know Another thing that that I heard in one of your lectures say, which really resonated with me, and I thought, oh yeah, that's me too. When we don't over the day deal with our stress loads and get them under control through, say, something like box breathing or going and doing yes. a bit of movement in nature and and keeping them yes. down, then by 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 night time, and I, I think a lot of us can relate to this. We've got fabulous willpower all day. I get up, I do my veggie smoothies. I'm doing my Pilates, I'm doing my yoga, I'm sitting in the sun, I'm doing the thing, I'm doing my cold showers. Cold and then plunge, come, you name it. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it all, right? And then I'm, I'm working over the day, my stress levels are building, my stress levels, the tigers are chasing me, the tigers are coming for me. By seven o'clock at night, I'm in the effort mode, you know? I'm in the Where's the chocolate mode? You know, I need um, I need a chocolate covered pretzel with sea salt and bacon. A bacon covering. on it, <laughs> and and you lose control at that point, right? And we've all done it. I mean, you know, and the more stress you've had on that day. In other words, if you what you said really, and this is something that stayed with me. One of your lectures was yeah. Do the box breathing throughout the day. Lower those stress levels. Do whatever you need to, to, to keep those stress levels under control so that you have control over those hedonic urges at nighttime. Absolutely. Because otherwise they are coming for you. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. They, you, you'll, you'll get to the point where you think you got to rub that food on your head. <laughs> right? It's like, I could just get this cookie in my head. <laughs> right? I, everything will be better. Yeah, and, and you I, never I mean, it's, beat it's one of the biggest things that I deal with with people, to be honest with you. It's yeah. controlling nighttime cravings. I'm yeah. incredibly familiar with it. And you know, it's interesting. People that get bariatric surgery, they can't eat anymore. They become alcoholics. Wow. Or they become shopaholics or they begin to gamble. Yeah. Um, when you think of people that are alcoholic, they go to AA, they don't drink alcohol, but what do they end up doing? Smoking cigarettes and drinking high caffeine drinks. Right. 
we've got it's, this it, and need. it's because your brain is saying i i need cooled down yeah i'm frightened the, i'm a scared the, child the, i'm frightened i need comfort i need reward and when until you get that under control i honestly believe that i don't care what you do it's like that your brain is at the center of the universe right yeah. it's like when 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 it's on fire your metabolism is in trouble yeah and so how do we get these so we don't get into that state of these hedonic urges that none of us are going to win against right we we, we, we right. and people think then that they're weak and they've got no willpower and they oh. start hating on themselves and then that yeah. is a spiral then that makes it worse well stuff it i might as well have another cookie because well, I've already eaten five. Steam issues, yeah. Right? yeah. 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 And it's a vicious cycle. And, and and so we need to understand our evolutionary biology and then the modern world that we're in. And then how do I actually control those stress levels? Which, you know, let's be honest, we've all got it. We've all got stress. Oh, we can't stop the stress. So how so you, you were talking about box breathing. What else can we do that that can help us keep those levels under control during the day so we don't lose our Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, I mean, the box breathing piece, it's super important for people to, to remember that on your exhale, so inhale four seconds, hold four seconds, exhale, you're thinking about what you want, the stress you're under and how you're letting it go. Then you hold for four seconds, right? So it's four, 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 four. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is at the end of those three or four minutes that you do is that you think of something you're grateful for. Ah. That's a so good the, one. That, that piece of being grateful is really important. What are the other things that you can do? Well, you know, I think movement is important. So not just getting stuck at your laptop or in front of your screen uh, and and being frozen, right? And you're and you're like this, your head's here and your your neck goes yeah, forward, forward and now your rib cage is collapsing and now you're not oxygenating yourself. You're building more lactic acid, just posturally, you know, sitting wow. the new smoking, right? Yeah. Uh, and that was Kelly Sterrett that said that. Yeah, I love Kelly uh, Sterrett. He's great. Which is great, the old Supple Leopard book. Uh, oh. But um, I think that, you know, so so that's important, you know, understand movement. Um, getting regular exercise, not too much, mm. but enough that you because that's how you keep the stress hormones in a circadian rhythm. I think going to bed by 10 o'clock at night and waking up in the morning, you know, making sure that you're, if you can, you know, if your profession doesn't allow it, you're a night shift worker, that's fine. But if you can sleep from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., really good. Yeah. Uh, yep. So that's important. And then it's about food. And so in the morning when your cortisol is high, that is the worst time to eat carbs. Because wow. when cortisol is high, your insulin receptors are sluggish. And that's why when people eat oats or cereal or bread in the morning, mm. they'll get crashes. Wow. And it's because that's not when your body should be taking in carbs. You should be taking your carbohydrate in if you're going to take them in. Um, you take them in in the evening because that builds your serotonin pool, you know, when you need it at night, right? But, but about more, three hours before more, bed, not so not too close to bed. Yeah, so yeah. It's like three hours before bed for sure. Like I'd usually mm -hmm. tell people try to hit an eating window seven to seven, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it's interesting, you know, everybody talks about, because you know, I did a lot of work on, you know, kind of on fasting and yeah. fasting diet and worked with you know all those folks and researched it a lot so you know it's interesting because i look back at it first of all most of my people that do 16 8 or are i look at their blood labs and they're not really that good really yeah, yeah. they don't do that well on 16 8 not wow. here anyway and then i look at how i grew up as a child and you know i ate breakfast at seven I had lunch around 1130 in my little lunch pail, going to school. Uh, and then I came home, I ate around five o'clock. And if I was a really good little Italian boy, I'd get a snack right around seven. And after that, kitchen is closed. Do not go in the kitchen. Do not make a mess. 
You've had plenty to eat. 12, 12. 12, 12. And you think that that's and, a, because uh, you, you, you know, this is, a lot of people are doing the intermittent fasting and even the one meal a day. And yeah, there are certain circumstances if you're dealing with cancer or things like that, that that's, that's another conversation. But that's for right. the average person, you know, should we be doing the 16 eight is a very common one or the one meal a day is quite a powerful one. What are you seeing in people's blood labs when you see them on one meal a day? What's happening yeah, I don't to like their blood? Past four, I don't like people going past 14, 10 and, so triglycerides go up, their cortisol goes up, their the cortisol, glucose yeah. goes up. They have more inflammatory compounds in their in their labs. Um, if you looked at the research, when I talked to the researchers at the Keck Center for Longevity, they said yeah. when they had animals on, you know, greater than 14 hours, and then they sacrificed them, looked at their organs, they could see reduced like blood flow or ischemia, right? Wow. You're, you know, you're compromising your organs by doing it all the time. No, it, it, now when you take somebody at 60 pounds overweight or let's say 30, 28 kilos, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're 28 to 30 kilos overweight and you um, put them on a 16, eight. Well, of course you're going to feel good for a while. Mm -hmm. Not overeating because in general, people eat too much. They eat too often. They eat too late. They pick the wrong foods. They're under a lot of stress and they don't get enough sleep. Mm. So if I, I'm taking one of the variables out by saying I'm not going to have you eat as much, People feel better for a period of time, but you know, that it's whether or not you're catabolic, what is your lean mass? Because in the end, muscle is the currency of aging. Absolutely. I preach that all you the need time. To hold on to your lean mass. And when you're only eating one meal a day and you're trying to exercise, a lot of times you get a little catabolic and, mm. you know, so watching your labs, are things improving or not, I think is an essential piece to this yeah. because we don't look at them. We just go, well, I look better. Well, skinny people die too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and this is a, um, you know, something that I've you know witnessed on myself is that, you know, when I was younger, I actually started running because I was chubby, you know, I was heavier on the heavier side. I was muscular. I come from a Maori ancestry. We're all big people. Sure. We're quite strong. Um, yep. But and so I started running and then I started running longer because I wasn't losing the weight and then I ran longer and longer and longer and I still wasn't losing the weight. But I kept running more because that's what they told you calories in, calories out, right? And and then I ended up it became my sport and so it had other purposes as well. But from a, a weight, pure weight perspective, I put on weight. You know, I didn't I didn't lose weight and I struggled. I was always like five or six pounds overweight. It wasn't fat, but I was just that little bit heavier than I should have been for my sport. And then right. when I stopped doing the ultra marathons and I learned all of this from genetics and everything else that I studied and did, um, it was like, oh my God, I've been doing the wrong thing and the wrong thing for my genetics, certainly. And now I do lots of shorter, sharper, high intensity workouts combined with a heck of a lot of yoga, breath work, meditation, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Pilates, the things that bring me down because I've got way yes. too much adrenaline, you know, because I'm a type A sort of, uh, you know. <laughs> Go, go, go. I never would have picked that up. No. That's strange. I wonder why, because I'm looking in the mirror. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um but but this is the 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 change that I made then then and then I started to lose the the extra body fat, get super lean. And then I started to think, oh heck, I'm getting catabolic now, you know, and I've got to really mm. go now to to put on muscle mass, whereas I used to put on muscle mass like that. And of course now I'm 55 and I'm like, I'm, I'm struggling to keep my muscle mass and my IGF one up and my, you know, so it's gone and flipped completely the other way. So that's the stuff I have to be aware of now. And this is where it can get confusing for people because you've got this mTOR and AMPK and I've done lectures on these and, you know, like growth hormone and no growth hormone. And if you want to live long, IGF no growth hormone. Bad, no. mTOR is bad. mTOR is bad and IGF-1. Yeah. Yeah, it's bloody confusing. Growth versus catabolism, you know, like how do we play that game and get it right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I would, what I would say on that, because obviously a lot of that was coming out of Walter, Walter Longa's work and, yeah. you know, I really respect Walter, um, but I think it's, you know, your, if your growth hormone is too low, it's obvious that it's bad. Plenty of literature to support that. 
And when your growth hormone is too high, like in people that are insulin resistant or diabetic, it's bad because it stimulates cell growth. Mm. Okay, so so the reality mm. is, is you want to be in that healthy in between. Mm. So you don't want to be too low and you don't want to be too high. And, you know, when people start to say things like mTOR is bad, I go, well, wait a second. It's in your body for a reason. Why is mTOR there? Well, mTOR is there in order to help you carry amino acids onto your muscle and maintain lean mass. The problem is, is when we eat all the time and our nutrient sensing is upregulated, we just keep triggering that mTOR. So we're creating an excess instead of when you stop eating, you trigger your natural autophagy. So you eat during the day, you don't eat at night, you, you clean up or in Chinese medicine, your Shen cycles, right? Um, for you to, you know, do the house cleaning, you know, mm -hmm. clean up the endoplasmic reticulum, yeah. get rid of the waste proteins, get rid of the waste immune compounds. If you're eating all the time, your brain is signaling, hey, we can't clean up. We got to process. Yeah. We have food to process. We can't clean up cells. Yep. No, we'll and so that's where we get in that whole thing of mTOR. mTOR is good. Too much mTOR stimulation is bad. IGF-1, growth hormone are good. Too much or too little is bad. And it's getting that balance. And when, I, when, I, when I'm spending more time with people today, because we're all in this longevity mode, mm -mm. I'm going to take stuff that's going to drive my cells to perform at their best. I think we're losing sight of the homeostasis. Yep. What we really need to do is to get our system of systems, our whole body communicating with us, right? Everything's communicating and keeping a balance in your chemistry. It's not that you're pushing. I, I like to use the term, you know, bright stars burn fast. Yeah, and burn out. <laughs> right? Burn out, you know. And and so I think, you know, when we're trying to put on muscle, yes, we want to be anabolic. Do we want to be excessively anabolic? No. Do we want to be catabolic? No. Mm. Do we want to have the ability for our immune system to clean up, Right our our waste products from our metabolism absolutely right does it make sense to occasionally do a one-day fast or do a five-day fasting mimic diet uh kit mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely if you're able to tolerate it of yep. course and and just understanding that balance you're bringing a very because you you know and I think all of us has done this. We've we've chased the latest trend and we've gone with the, the 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 latest research and stuff. And then what I see happening now that I've been around for you know only ten years in the space, if you like, but not as long as you. But you start to see the swings and balances, and everything sort of comes back into the middle, but a slightly better middle than the than the uh, you know eat six meals a day and you know which was the, you know what we used to do um when you're training right. you know you gotta you gotta keep your your, your right. things keep up eating, otherwise keep, you eating. keep eating yeah and, and as an ultra marathoner we used to like literally every 15 minutes put something in our mouth if you're running say 200 300 kilometers you had to put something in your mouth every but only right. because we were not that adapted we were not we were not using sure. um fat at all you know now yeah, right we know a little bit better of, of how to, 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 to balance that. And you see some athletes sure. who have gone full keto, um, not a heck of a lot though. Not, not, not everybody like is in full adaptation to, to right. adaptation, but I think in the lower, you know, the slower endurance based sports, you can, you can sort of do that if you've got a year or two to transfer your body over from one system to the other, but that sort That's of, right. you know, I think for the average person listening to this, what are, what are some of the takeaways from today that you would like to wrap up in a bundle for people? So to the average person's got, you know, stress, small job, kids, sure. parents, what's going on? They're trying to right. get a grip. They're trying not to be overweight. They're trying not to be diabetic. They don't want cancer. What do they do? Well, all right. So the first thing is, is uh, find joy in your life. Number one. <laughs> find joy in your life that's number one that takes a lot of stress away second is, is you got to be honest about your stress are you anxious are you nervous are you overcommitted? do you do you crave carbs and sweets in the evening and or are you having trouble sleeping 
If you're having trouble sleeping, that's called a disorder of hyperarousal. That's insomnia. Insomnia is a disorder of hyperarousal of the HPA axis. Yeah. So look and be honest about your stress. Now, what's the one thing you can do that will help you through that day? It may mean I got to go to counseling because maybe something traumatic happened. Who knows what it is, right? But at least box breathe twice a day. Yeah. That's simple. Try to do it at noon. Try to do it at the end of the day. The next piece, high protein for breakfast. Don't go high carb at breakfast because when you go high carb at breakfast, you're going to trigger your glucose and insulin and the rest of your day is going to be a mess. You're going to go up and down with your energy and you're going to have to eat six times a day. And remember, every time you eat, you release a little cortisol. It's not just glucose and insulin. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. And you should also know that the, the single biggest trigger for cardiovascular disease is post-meal hyperglycemia. Yeah. High blood sugar. That's the that number one eat. cause yep. of artery plaque and heart disease. So, so, you know, first it's manage that, that stress, do box breathing, understand your sleep cycle, limit your caffeine. Don't overdo caffeine. I mean, yep. a lot of people overdoing caffeine to get through their day. Yeah. The next piece I would say is, you know, get movement in. If, if you're not going to exercise formally, go out and walk. Get a 50-minute walk in five days a week. If you can do more than that, you're more committed. I love training. I've trained my whole life. Mm, you know, I, I, I get after it. Um, but I've also learned from the time how I train in my sixties is different than how I trained in my twenties, different than my thirties, uh, forties and fifties. Yeah. I have to train different now since I'm, you know, you know, just shy of a cane, I guess. I don't, <laughs> you know. I don't think that's happening anytime soon, Jim. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that's super important food. You nailed it. Get familiar with veggies. And I always tell people three or four vegetables to every fruit. Wow, that's a good ratio. That's a good one. Because a lot of people eat a lot of fruit thinking it's healthy. And it is yeah. to a degree. But yeah. sugar's in there. Sugar. And our fruit and vegetables are bred for sugar nowadays. They're not what our grandparents ate, right? An apple that's now right. is three times the size and it's way sweeter. That's so maybe exactly a slice of apple. People drink juices. Oh, juices. They are a big juices. no no. You may as well drink a yep. your angel drink a Coca-Cola if you're gonna yep. drink a fruit juice. Uh, and this it's is I think really get you words. Yeah, that's one of the really easy wins. You see people having these smoothies and they're like full of healthy and they've got green stuff in them, but they've got a banana and they've got an apple in it and they've got carrots in it and that sugar, 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 sugar. Yeah, you know, hundred percent. So uh, I think eating your veggies, three or four to one vegetables to fruit. Oh, try to assess, well, how many carbs from, you know, legumes or a grain do I really need to get through my day? I'm big on very, I, I don't eat a lot of grain related carbs. Mm, mm. I eat vegetable related carbs for the yep. most part. Yep. And I enjoy some legumes, not a lot, but, you know, but then vegetables big and then lean proteins. The more you exercise, the more you have to look for iron deficiency. Right. It's a very common thing for people who exercise more than an hour a day. Yep. That they become iron deficient. And the other thing is, if you have good iron, but your ferritin is low. Yeah. What's that, that about? Why is that happening? Well, this is another little trick. Yeah. This is a sign of metabolic inflammation. When you're mm -hmm. releasing inflammatory cytokines, your liver turns on or upregulates hepcidin. Mm -hmm. And hepcidin turns down the production of ferroportin, mm -hmm. which means you don't store your iron as ferritin. And now you make less erythropoietin, which means I make less red blood cells. Yeah, wow. And I don't carry oxygen as well. So when you're metabolically inflamed, you can have a normal iron, a low ferritin, you got to look around and go, what am I doing? It's causing inflammation in my body. Wow. So and that's so a sign. Replace that... iron. Here's yep. the thing. If, you, if you're going to give iron, you should only give it every other day. Because if you take it daily, right, you upregulate hepcidin. So you take it every other day so that you don't upregulate the hepcidin and don't limit wow. your conversion to ferritin. 
Wow. Okay. That's just a, a clinical pearl right there because, you know, that that's really, really, so many people are dealing with this and a lot of women deal with anemia. Like I had a whole career dealing with anemia and trying to be an endurance athlete. That was fun. You know, yeah. you got no, yeah. you got no, I remember racing in the Himalayas. I did a 222K race in the, uh, at, up between 3,600 and 5,800 meters. We had to oh go like God. huge. Like, how did your heart rate stay intact? I don't know how I survived, to be honest. I was like the, you know, we've got about, uh, what was it? 30% of the oxygen up that level is what we would have normally. And I'm an asthmatic and I was severely anemic on top of it. And I had a hypoxic brain concussion from doing hypoxic um, training in a tent that I went too high too fast. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. Um, it took me 53 hours and five minutes and I, I got there, but I actually broke me. I never got back to full health again after that. I remember the following week, three teeth fell out, you know, like oh, it was God, yeah. in your nervous system. Oh. Your autonomic nervous system just shuts down and now you're losing your HRV and you're, you know, you start to see changes in, you know, I'll send you the documentary. You'll the, be like, what the hell was she thinking? <laughs> no, I get what you were thinking. It's like when I put 900 pounds on my back to squat it, it's like, why am I doing that? I mean, <laughs> you know, when am I ever going to need to squat 900 pounds? Yeah, never. But and then you get older. There. Yeah, older and wiser, right? And you look back and you yeah. go, yeah, those were the glory days. Never going to do them again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but glad that you did it. Glad you had the experience and lived sure. to tell the tale. But damage, damage done to the body, massive. And, you know, not carrying the oxygen, of course, you know, the, the, the you know, um, that, that's, not, that's not great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get great. a lot of free radical damage from that. And, you know, the other thing is, is the more you train, the more you collapse your microcapillaries, right? So you lose your wow. four, six, and eight micron microcapillaries. Wow. So Didn't you lose that. perfusion into your organs. Wow. And so, you know, you, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that it's your glycocalyx gets broken. You know, you shut down your glycocalyx, the inner lining of your artery, and you get collapse of those microcapillaries. Now Gosh. I can't deliver the oxygen into the tissues like I should. Why is and that so happening? You can fix that. Yeah. Why is that happening? Like, because when you're training, you'd think you'd have better perfusion, you know, more blood flow. It's, just, it's the same old story, right? Right. <laughs> Some much. training is good. Too much training is not so good. Right. <laughs> it happens a lot in, in people that train a lot and put on a ton of lean mass, right? Because they're training and training and training. And all of a sudden, you know, they're the person having the heart attack, right? You lose perfusion. Wow. And so one of the cool things there is obviously like the fucoidins, the seaweeds, the glycosamine and glycans. It was interesting when people were taking glucosamine, the side effect of glucosamine when they tracked people over time was that they weren't getting heart attacks. Really? Wow. And they weren't getting heart attacks because the glycosamine and glycans helped to rebuild the inner lining wow. of the microcapillaries and keep the microcapillary network strong so that you could carry oxygen to all your tissues. The glycocalyx is something that's, you know, been on my radar for a few years and, and there is, you know, like things like Arterosil, which is from a seaweed and, um, yeah. you know, and the Calyx Pro, right? Another yeah. one. Yeah. All these great things now that are, that are helping protect and, you know, I've got really poor genetics from that perspective, like the linings, the 9P21 gene is very, very poor. So I have to, you know, now that I know that and I've got a history of strokes and aneurysms in the family, um, we go hard at trying to protect that glycocalyx, you know, oh, yeah. because otherwise we're going to end up, you know, with another aneurysm or a stroke. And, oh. and kidney failure. I mean, well, I, I had a lady with a mm. 18 GFR, which means basically she's getting ready for transplant. Wow. 18 GFR. Oh, Diabetic. Gosh. Yeah. We we now have her GFR in the 60s. Wow. How did you do that? So That's something I'm struggling with. Yeah, we worked with her glycocalyx. We ah. got her diet right. We cleaned up her yeast because all diabetics have yeast. Wow. We were, we gave her aged garlic extract, pyolic, because that improves peripheral circular activity. It reduces left ventricle volume. So that, you know, diabetics tend to have a, they have an enlarged left ventricle. Wow. And so we, so we get the pump pumping better. We get the vessels dilating because there's multiple studies on aged garlic extract and blood pressure. 
and then we clean up and repair the glycocalyx. And then we give some uh, support to the kidneys like Shatavari or Saladego uh, that help to improve uh, drainage and, and uh, renal function. And her numbers turned around and she, but she did manage her diabetes well after that. Like when it, we taught her how to yeah. eat, we got her sugars down so that she wasn't releasing all that adrenaline and restricting her blood flow. People don't understand that 40% of all hypertension is due to renal hypertension. Really? No, that I didn't yeah, know. You're, you're, yeah, your kidney shut down because, you know, you're insulin resistant, you're diabetic, and, you know, the blood vessels clamp up, go into the kidneys, mm -hmm. that's, and, and the kidneys die a slow death. They wow. die, they get yeah, that, more oxidation. And so that's why, why diabetics we, always have kidney issues. And it's why all of our dialysis centers are full of diabetics. Wow. And I didn't understand the glycocalyx connection there to the to the kidney. And kidneys are something that I struggle with because I had rhabdomyolysis about a thousand times in my life, right, <laughs> from doing ultramarathons. And so my EGFR is just barely in the late 50s. You know, yeah. and, and so that's something I'm worried about, right? Because it's probably my shortest fuse at the moment. <laughs> so trying yeah. to rebuild them. So, okay, I need to go hard. So I have put aged uh, garlic into my regime recently because I heard one of your lectures on that. And yeah. um, maybe I'll get... You're doing our Terracil? I was doing that for mom, but I hadn't put it in for me. So maybe I need to do that for myself as well. Mm. Thank 100%. you for that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> thank 100%. you. Hundred percent. That. That's see why that her kidney functions her kidney functions better than mine. <laughs> and at eighty two, <laughs> hers right. is always in the seventies and eighties, and I'm like in the fifties and sixties, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's not great. <laughs> yeah, oh, I know, I oh. know. But no, you'll you'll see a big improvement with that when you add those two together. Yeah. Very powerful the kidneys oh, right i'm off to buy some arteriosil uh dr jim you've been absolutely wonderful i'd love to have you back on um because i think we could bloody chew the flat fat for uh, a long time on all of this stuff I'm, i want to thank you so much sir for your time oh uh, my very pleasure. appreciated and um uh, dr jim where can people find you you've written so many books you've got so many courses you are the academic uh leader at uh or educator at a4m uh, I won't butcher your entire CV because it's just so long. I'll put it in the show notes, but um, <laughs> tell us where people can find you. And do you work still with, with patients and do you work telehealth with patients? Cause I, I work telehealth with patients. I still work with patients. Um, JimLaval.com is the mm -hmm. easy way to do it. JimLaval.com. And uh, look, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, you know, anytime you want to have me back, you just shoot me a note. Ah, oh, absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Joe.